So welcome everyone from near and far. Very excited to welcome you to this ninth installment, I believe, of NCFS in captivity. Some people measure the pandemic in sourdough starters or Netflix or I don't know, novels that you read. But over here, we uh, in Zoomland, we measure in NCFS in captivity, which has been just such a great, um, fun monthly book series if I may say so myself, um, in which we have the opportunity to discuss recent books in 19th century French studies broadly defined. Um, it's of course a placeholder for our beloved conference, which hopefully will happen in some, well, will definitely happen in one, one way or another in the fall. Um, but we do hope that this series will also continue. So keep emailing us um, at the NCFS book series at gmail.com. Um, or directly with any ideas for, um, for books that you think would be a good fit. Um, I want to thank my co-organizers, uh, Masha Belenke, who is um, away um, right now with, the, with her family. So unfortunately, I think is only kind of joining us through the phone. Um, and Susan McCready, um, who have um, it's just been a pleasure to work with for um, these past many months and um, are, uh, you know, without whom today would not have been possible. So I am very pleased to introduce Raisa Rexer, Assistant Professor of French at Vanderbilt University. She is the author of scholarly articles about the history of photography, the relationship between photography and literature, and the history of pornography in the 19th century, as well as catalog essays and freelance art criticism. In addition to her book, her most recent projects include an entry on the photographer Laure Barquet for Une Histoire Mondiale des Femmes Photographes, just released by Édition Textuelle, a piece on the photography of the Commune, which is in that um, special issue of 19th Century French Studies, the journal, which um, is amazing and just came out, commemorating the Commune's 150th anniversary, and an article on René Mesrois, in a forthcoming special issue of Yale French Studies on Photography and the Body in 19th Century Fran France, which she co-edited with Anne Linton. And Alex K. Wetlaufer will be interviewing her. She is a professor of French and Comparative Literature at the University of Texas at Austin, specializing in 19th Century French and British Literature, Gender, and the Visual Arts. She's published broadly in these areas and is currently working on her fourth book entitled Rereading George, Sand, Elliot, and Novel Disruptions, for which she received a Guggenheim Fellowship. Alex is co-editor of 19th Century Context, an interdisciplinary journal, and encourages everyone to submit their articles. <laughs> so I will hand it over to them. I'm gonna unmute myself first. I do know how to use Zoom. I have been doing it for a long time. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen now. And before I even begin, I also would like to thank uh, the organizers of the wonderful book series, NCFS in Captivity, Rachel, Masha, and Susan for putting it together and for inviting me to speak. And I wanna thank Alex for agreeing to be my interlocutor today, which involved reading my book rapidly. Um, and also thank everyone for coming uh, at a moment that I know is probably very busy for everyone after a long year of teaching during COVID. So thank you all. Let me, there we go. This book began as a chance discovery on the internet some 14 years ago. One day, I was looking at some of the very first digitized images among the early online resources of the Bibliothèque Nationale, and I came across a nude photograph from the 1850s. I was totally floored. I had not even thought about the existence of such images in the as early as the 19th century. And perhaps even more than that, I was surprised by the fact that that photograph immediately reminded me of various scenes in Nana, Emile Zola's infamous novel of P Parisian prostitution, which I happened to be reading at the time. Once I saw this first photograph, I began to see these images everywhere I looked in many literary texts. So my project really began as an attempt to understand how and why nude photographs would have made their way into these literary works, including Zola's. 
As I began to unpack their literary significance, however, it became evident to me just how little work had been done systematically on the history of nude photographic imagery in France at this time, outside of a few very significant uh, articles and catalogs done by various French and American art historians. So as I was working on the literary chapters of the book, a second arc began to take form as I not only decided to look at the literary traces of these images, but also to piece together their history and the history of the broader cultural attitudes toward them as they evolved in the 19th century. To achieve these paired goals, the book proceeds chronologically. It's divided into two parts, the first of which focuses on the Second Empire, the period from 1851 to 1870, and the second focuses on the first three decades, give or take, I'm loosey-goosey maybe with the end date, of the Third Republic. Each section of the book includes two chapters that are more historical historical and focused on nonfiction texts, and then two chapters that are focused on literary texts. So to begin with the Second Empire, during the Second Empire, the history of the nude in France is really determined by the role of censorship auth authorization in photographic production. By the 1850s in France, artists had actually already begun working from nude figure studies, photographic figure studies. Um, they include some of the most well-known artists to work from nude figure studies include Delacroix, Courbet, and Jérôme, who commissioned the image I'm showing here from Nadar sometime in 1860 or 1861 as a study for his painting, Friday before the Areopagus. But even more importantly than these individual commissions, under an 1852 censorship decree, which required pre-authorization of all visual images for sale, hundreds, and I truly think potentially thousands, although it's very hard to get a grasp on exactly how many images were authorized, um, of nude images were authorized for legal sale. And so these images were allowed to circulate relatively freely at the time with some conditions placed on them. And I've just included one example of one of these legal art nudes or academy as they were called, which, which is a photograph submitted by the photographer Marconi in 1869. So what this the censorship inadvertently did was effectively create a genre of art nudity that was sanctioned by the government and then was integrated into ongoing discussions about the art value of photography at the time. Now, of course, not surprisingly at all, even as photographers were producing these legal images, a burgeoning industry of illicit image imagery also strung, uh, sprung up at the time. Both of these were focused in Paris, which was the center of photographic production at the time and is also where we have the most records. So even as the government was authorizing all kinds of nudity for sale, the police were actively pursuing and monitoring models, photographers, and distributors of illicit nudity. And they recorded a lot of information at the time in a document that's been kept in the police archives and is known by its call number, the BB3. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you two images from the BB3 and these will be the most explicit images for this portion of the presentation. So this is one page, an example of the, the way that photographs were used um, and some of the entries that they included in this document with information about various people involved. And this second page, I actually had to cut from my book because it was considered too graphic, but you get to see it for attending the talk. <laughs> Just to give you an example of, of um, there, most of the images in my book are not this graphic, um, but there really was graphic pornography uh, circulating from very early on in the history of photography. So from the BB3, uh, a picture of this industry emerges, including ever increasing quantities of photographs in circulation in Paris and in France at the time. During the Second Empire, the biggest individual recorded seizure that is 
um, in the BB3 is a seizure of about 2000 images and negatives from the pornographer, photographer, pornographer, um, Auguste Bullock in the early 1960s. Now, the problem was, as it always has been, that the two categories that were enshrined in the law couldn't actually be kept distinct from each other. The censorship law was absolute and allowed the government to sidestep legal arguments about the content of images, but it was also very arbitrary and the censors tended to have widely variable and hard to discern standards for authorization. So as a result, there was a lot of overlap between legal and illegal production of nudity, both in terms of aesthetics and in terms of the personnel involved. Many photographers who registered and authorized legal imagery in the Depot Legal records also appear in police records. The same is true of models. And at an aesthetic level, many images really ride the line between the licit and illicit from both sides of the law. So during the Second Empire, there's really the creation of two legal categories that bleed into each other. And what was really fascinating fascinating to me is that as a result, it wasn't so much that people reacted by rejecting the art aspirations of nude photography outright, but rather that there's a lot of anxiety about both the artistic value of certain nudes and their social role and their potentially social, uh, nefarious social influence. So the first portion of the book on the Second Empire focuses on the way that the anxieties about art color the discourse on nude photography. And it includes a chapter on the female nude photographic model who becomes a flashpoint for both contemporary concerns about female sexuality and about the art value of photographic nudity, as well as uh, two chapters about Baudelaire and the Goncourt brothers. Those two chapters on Baudelaire and the Goncourt brothers focus on the way that our, uh, the nude photograph posed certain artistic problems for these authors. And what, what I find really fascinating in turn about the reactions of both Baudelaire and the Goncourt brothers is that they overwhelmingly rejected nude photography as an art form, but then it becomes very clear that this new genre is at the same time really important to the way that they were attempting to formulate ideas about art and the body and the representation of the body and art's relationship to reality. So then in the second part of the book, I turn to the period after 1870. From, eight, from 1870 to 1881, despite the change in the government in France, the censorship laws remained in effect for images. However, after 1881, when censorship of images was finally abolished, the, the government in France, which had previously very strictly legislated uh, nudity and its distribution and production, uh, basically abdicated its role in legislating a police sitting nudity. And so the old categories of licit and illicit nudity, which were nebulous but still existed under the law totally disappear and they're basically replaced with a kind of a mass of indiscernible nude imagery with no de facto distinctions in the eyes of the government. So at the same time that this happens, there's a legal change, uh, we see a lot of changes and developments in image formats and production. So I just thought I would throw a few in here. So for instance, the 1880s seems the arrival of the cabinet card in large quantities. A lot of these images are just ones that I liked or thought would be fun to include. Um, uh, they also, very late in the century, into the turn of the 20th century, we start to see magazines of nude images, ostensibly for artists. And then, of course, uh, in the 1890s, the picture postcard arrived, which really revolutionizes the distribution of these images. And all these changes in format, uh, particularly the postcard, uh, accompany drastic increases in production. So by the end of the century, we're talking about millions of images rather than thousands. And this distribution is now occurring, occurring on a much more international scale, moving in and out of France. 
So alongside these legal and industrial changes, during the Third Republic, the language used to discuss photographic nudity shifts drastically away from discussions about art to concerns about the social role of these images. So for instance, in the place of the older obsession with the female model from earlier in the century, coverage of nude photography during the Third Republic reflects a pervasive obsession with its place in the street. Nudes were being distributed in increasing numbers in public and semi-public spaces, and by the end of the century, they were integrated into a larger discourse about social degeneration and the various dangerous people and behaviors of the insalubrious thoroughfares of Paris and other large cities. And that same shift plays out in slightly more nuanced terms in the literary texts of the later 19th century. So returning finally to Zola, the allusions to nude photography in Nana are closely connected to its critique of the sexual economy of prostitution. And similarly, the popular novels of René Mesrois at the fin du siècle associate nude photographic imagery with problematic sexual desire, often gendered male, both within and outside the structures of prostitution. So both these texts are a far cry from early debates about the artistic dangers of nude photography. So this is where I, I'll conclude. And I, I wanna note that um, coming up to the end of my book was, was also one of the most important things to come out of the project for me because less so in the beginning of the century, but by the end of the 19th century, I could really recognize the kind of language being dis being used to discuss photographic nudity, which underlined for me just how contingent our language about the body is and the way that it has shifted based on historical context and technological development, it also really surprisingly revealed to me the degree to which our current language for discussing nudity is a product of the 19th century. And so my hope is that my early moment of recognition online can open up new ways of thinking about these images, both in the past and in the future. Okay. Thank you. That was great almost as great as the book, which I loved. Everybody should read it. It's, um, it's just as Reza did a beautiful job laying out the social and cultural history of the female nude within both the aesthetic and the legal contexts of art, pornography. And really what's so interesting too is this idea of the visibility of that perpetually invisible figure of the model. So all of a sudden it's a body, but it's also potentially a real person. Um, so it's a page turner because we have law and censorship and naked ladies and sexuality and art and prostitution and labor and technology. Um, so you've just done a magnificent job of bringing all of these discourses and, and considerations together. So I just wanted to say what I found most compelling, probably because it's where my mind is a bunch of the time is the way this tackles um, what I think is the most important question of the of 19th century art, which is what is the relationship between representation and the real? I think everybody is struggling with it. Perhaps we're still struggling today. And that will be my last question. Um, so what is the real? What defines obscenity and who should enforce the limits? Um, and also the idea of the, the, the very power of art, the power of the image or the power of words over an audience. Um, so if somebody is representing, or as many of the artists at the time were saying, documenting a real body or real uh, human behaviors, can it be immoral? Um, and then of course that takes us to the Stendhal quotation of, you know, the novel is someone carrying a mirror down the road. So if you see mud, don't blame the mirror, blame the road and the, um, uh, the person who's supposed to be keeping up the road. So, um, so what art should represent and how it should be represented and how it should represent is, is really key. And um, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, the first question though is um, one of the many merits of this book is the enormous number of illustrations you have, which really give us a good sense of the, um, 
the trajectory of the nude um, and the female figure in the 19th century in these, in these photographs, which I think we're so much less aware of than we are of in painting. Um, and I found the image on the cover particularly stunning. I, it really spoke to me. And it's the one you start the, your, your study with. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about this particular image. Um, this one here. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's, there it is. I have it too. Yuck. <laughs> Could hold it while I talk. Yeah, this is it. I mean, it's on the cover because it's an image that really spoke to me as well. And it's actually part of a lo my longer term goals for continuing after this project. But so this image uh, is a legally authorized nude and it was submitted for authorization in the early 1860s. But part of what makes it emblematic for me is some degree of mystery over the actual origins of it. You know, the fact that photographers could legally submit nudes and were allowed then to be, to have some guarantee, I don't know how, per, I can't say it was a perfect guarantee at all, but some guarantee of protection against prosecution once those images were authorized means that we have this treasure trove of imagery and of records, but then again, because photography is a mechanical process and because I found examples of photographs that were submitted years later and I knew couldn't possibly have been actually photographs of this very model were submitted some 20, 20 years later by a different photographer and I knew by then it couldn't she couldn't have posed for new photographs. There's a lot of mystery at the same time about the origins of this image and it's been attributed by one um, many so to back up one second, one of the problems of doing this work outside of public collections is the number of these images that are in private collections and therefore cannot be um, dated or attributed with total certainty. But there are some owners of old private collections who have done really great work. And one of them is Serge Nazarayev. And so he attributes this photograph to a photographer named Moulin, who I am also very interested to but I actually based on looking at many many different of her and of other models and by all the different photographers I think it might have been taken by the very Bullock whose house was raided in the early 1860s and who um, truly was considered to be one of the most uh, explicit pornographers and Alex I don't know do you want me to go down that road right now or <laughs> we can hold off <laughs> we can hold down on that but so yeah there are there are questions about the origins of these photographs even when they are legally registered even when for instance um this is one I remember when I first saw that image and it and just like the one that I found on the internet which actually isn't in the book um this image stopped me in my tracks and I just thought it's one of the first images I ever saw and I looked at it and I thought I've I everything I thought was wrong and I'm gonna have to start rethinking what this meant because it's such a striking and beautiful image so absolutely yeah um so you do a really lovely job moving between cultural and literary analysis and your chapters on Bourlet, Goncourt, and Zola are really exciting interventions into our conversations about these really familiar and often treasured, well, not, not men at, not men at Solomon, nobody, nobody loves that one. <laughs> but I have to say, I particularly loved your reading of Baudelaire and Charogne um, <laughs> through the lens of, and I quote, the beaver shot. Um, so I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about that idea, which, you know, it, it I know Abigail Salman Goodell used it years ago, it, it, it retains its shock value um, yes. because it seems such so contemporary and so bro-ish. Um, and then if you could talk a little bit about how, how you, because you were doing so many things, how you moved between cultural slash artistic analysis and then literary analysis and then part three, because I can never stop, um, how you see these authors using the photograph within their writing, in their poetry, and in their, um, okay. so, so it's a sort of genre. Okay, here we go. So to start with the beaver shot. So 
I did, um, I am gonna show people. So here we go. This didn't make it into my original PowerPoint for time purposes, but I do have this because it is a very important idea within the structure of the text. So to warn everyone, I'm gonna quickly show my screen again and the image is gonna be very graphic. So I don't want anyone to be surprised by what appears on your screen. So the beaver shot is one of the most um, explicit kinds of images to come out of 19th century photography. Here it is. The, uh, it's, so the example at the top is a stereograph made by Bullock, the same person who potentially created the cover of image of my book, although I, I cannot prove that. Um, and this is the perspective that the art historian Abigail Solomon Godot called the beaver shot. And on this particular slide, it's next to uh, Courbet's infamous painting because there has been some discussion of whether or not Belloc's photographs or images like them inspired that painting. But we'll, we'll shelve that question for the moment. So that's the beaver shot. And I will now unshare my screen so that we don't have to continue to look at it. Um, and what I talk about in Baudelaire is the way that that perspective on the body so takes over the meaning of a woman's sexuality that his poetry seems to react forcefully against it. And that's tied up with me, for me, with the ongoing debates over his poetry and whether or not we can really consider them to be obscene or if there are other ways to understand them. Um, you know, I, I sent that particular chapter out for review and one of the readers responded, well, I suppose this is one way we could recuperate Baudelaire from misogyny. And I don't, I don't really mean it in that way. It's not like an apology for Baudelaire's horrible attitude towards women. But I do think that as you read through poems like Une Charonne and Une Martia, that when we look at the most negative representations of female bodies, in Baudelaire's poetry, they are marked by posing that looks like the beaver shot. And then we can start to think about whether or not it's the female body as such that appears to be so dangerous in his poetry or whether or not it is this way of looking at the body that has been mediated by photography. And one of the important things that Abigail Solomon Godot says about that shot is, although it does exist in medical imagery before the 19th century, as an erotic image, photography introduces it. And so it's something that's very closely implicated in the medium and, and tied up in debates about how the medium represents the body. So that's for um, Baudelaire and the beaver shot. Um, did, did I completely answer your question? Because yeah, yeah, because I think what's so fascinating in your analysis too is that, you know, one thing you could say about the beaver shot, and like th these words have never come out of my mouth <laughs> in, in such uh, profusion, um, is it leaves nothing to the imagination. Right. And that's, I love the way you zero in on that's Baudelaire's potential objection to photography and perhaps that that is in a larger sense his objection to photography yeah. and you can see how someone who is so obsessed with the art value of the female body then would really respond negatively to a representation that took the locus of female sexuality and and male desire for the body and just said well here you go take a look you 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 get everything you can see and and there's nothing much left you know for for the poet to do with it yeah yeah because it's been it's there's there haven't been great explanations for Baudelaire's odd statements about photography and I think this is a really this is a really nice analysis of it um and I thought tying it into the poetry was great um so your approach to the the literary texts and your literary uh, well your author's approach to photography photographic texts right um Oh, right. So how I incorporate sort of the cultural and the literary. So yeah. when I talk about the origins, it's really true that this project, uh, the literary portions of this project were all written first, actually. Hmm. And they were written independently. And it truly was, I found this photograph and then I wrote about Nana. And then I said, 
uh, and I remember I had this conversation with Maury. I said, I I'm sure that's a one-time thing. And then all of a sudden I found things in Baudelaire and then it was the Goncourt <laughs> brothers. And then I said, okay, well, I guess this is no longer a one-time thing and it's a project. Um, and then I realized I was gonna have to really dig into the archives and do that historical and cultural work. And so that evolved later and it, they didn't intentionally treat the same thematics. It just became clear as I read that the ways that they fit together, that there was this sort of evolving understanding in the larger cultural sphere of how these images signified, and it really resonated with the different literary texts. So, you know, organizationally, there were many different things <laughs> that I did in the gazillions of revisions, but in a general sense, the way that it involved, evolved was the, the literary stuff was there, and all of a sudden I began to realize how much the, the sort of background noise was amplifying those ideas. Did, did coming upon these images change any of your, um, your readings of these texts? Um, that is such a good question. I don't think, I think one of the things that I was really lucky about is that I didn't come into the text with preconceived notions about them because I was, at the start of my graduate career, remarkably ignorant about French literature for someone who went on to get a doctorate in <laughs> French literature. I was in a complet program and I intended to focus in English. And so um, when I read Nana, I just thought, oh, okay, well, I see this photo and I see the photo in the book. And I, it didn't change my readings. It really sort of imprinted certain things upon them as I encountered the text. I had, of course, read Baudelaire before, but um, I hadn't really developed, I would say, a sustained take on his representation of women in, in, mm -hmm. in, in any kind of substantive way. And so it was more that they shaped my ideas rather than that they um, changed them, I would say. Right. Oh, and then the last part of your question is how, they, how I talk about them in relation to each other within the different literary. Um, or you know, we can skip that. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, I'm happy to say it because I think no, I was just saying, how do you I, I thought it was very interesting how you looked at how they are using the photograph yeah. in their um, in their own writing. Yes, because one of the things I also didn't do intentionally, but which ended up happening is uh, in each of the sets of literary texts, each author uses the images very differently. So um, in Baudelaire, there are all these visual allusions to certain kinds of photographs. In the Goncourt brothers, on the other hand, there's no passage in which there's a representation of the female body that speaks to nude photographic representation. Rather, there are explicit discussions in their journals and in their literary, in Manat Solomon, to the fact of nude photography. So um, in in Baudelaire, it's more sort of reading through the texts. Um, oh, I guess there is, I forgot about the um, public moderne, moderne et la photographie. I mean, he does invoke it in his nonfiction text, but in his poems, it's there's no reference to photographs. It's more reading through the poetry. And the same is true for Nana, um, although photographs come up in the novel, I'm more focused on readings of the body in my interpretation of Nana, whereas in Mezrois, he very explicitly talks about contemporary uses of nude photogra photography, um, how common it is. It appears as sort of a social artifact in many of his texts, so it's more explicit and less about visual interpretation. Okay, thank you. Okay, one thing I found surprising given the period is the absence of exotic or at least exoticized nudes here. Yes. Um, and this is a period when the female body, the naked, the erotic female body is in literature's overwhelmingly a racialized one. Um, and in part, I'm thinking here of, of Jenny Yee's book on cliché, mm -hmm. um, uh, cliché la femme exotique, there we go. So what explains this absence in the archive? Because I, I imagine if they were there, you would have found them and yeah. brought them to our attention. And then just let me tack on one thing. Um, even your title, The Fallen Veil, 
um, very much evokes colonial associations, as does the presence of these veils, a la Marnie Kessler draped all over the, uh, these nude white women's nude bodies. And that's, that's important. But at the same time, there seems to be a palpable absence of colonial, mm, um, yes. In these, so what's going on? Yes. Okay. So just, I'll pull up this one um, yeah. Yeah. to talk. This is sort of the most, there's one more in, later in the book that is of a woman in a hammock, which is slightly exoticized. But, you know, I was, I think, surprised by that as well. These images, at least the archival ones, are extremely white. Um, there are some, I would say, in black and white, more olive toned women, such as the woman on the cover of the book, except I have recently discovered she's Corsican. So that's her origin. Um, you know, here's what I think. The industry is in Paris and what we know about its history is um, there were some professional models, but it was largely guys collecting women prostitutes off the street. So there is some faux orientalism, which tends actually not to be veiling across the face or anything like that, but um, women wearing really shady turbans and things like that, um, which I'm not sure which culture that exactly is even <laughs> supposed to invoke, or there'll be like occasional photographs more when women are dressed called la juive or something like that. Um, I think it's white because it's a local industry, basically, especially the legally authorized ones and certainly the ones uh, that I have found that were illegal, that were kept by the police, donated to the library, etc. Now, that is less true later in the century. Um, but one of the things I talk about in the book is that by 1880, uh, and I, I really actually, by 1880, I kind of abdicate my role in attempting to explain to the reader what nudes would have looked like, because by then, the industry is so international. When we're talking about millions of images and people intentionally producing them elsewhere and shipping them to other countries so that they can avoid legal action, it's likely that there were a lot more Orientalist images appearing, and certainly um, by the turn of the century, when we start to see these magazines and we start to see um, photo illustrated books, there's a lot more sort of Orientalist imagery. But as a proportion of the total output, it's actually still very small in France from what I have seen. You know, we do know, for instance, that in Algeria, and I don't know if Ali is on the call today or not, um, but Ali Badad wrote something for Yale French Studies about Geyser's photographs in Algeria. And Geyser was producing nudes um, or semi-nudes uh, in the 1850s and 60s. But those images I were not registered for legal sale within mainland France. And we don't know to what degree that they were coming into France. Uh, until really the later part of the century and then the picture postcard. And then with the picture postcard, it's kind of like all bets are off and images are circling the globe. And we can assume that there were probably many such colonial images. Just to tack onto that question about, of, of the veil more specifically though, you know, to us, we hear veil and we think or Orientalism. But to them, they see veil and a naked lady and they think la jeune mariée. So it was the marriage veil side of things that seems to resonate more with photographers of the period. Mm -hmm. And I've found many other um, unregistered on eBay uh, stereographs of veiled women looking in mirrors, things like that. And, there, and those veer really more toward a marriage veil situation. So um, yeah, it is remarkably white. That is not to say that there are no Orientalist images. It's just also to say that of the hundred images or so that I put in there, I already had to cut so many and to sort of represent proportionally. I just put that one by Villeneuve, which I think more accurately represents what's going on, which is sort of a faux Orientalist right. exoticism. 
because it would really be interesting to see, to sort of look at the academy and wonder how many painters, probably not famous painters, turned these white bodies into an exotic um, image. Yes. Exoticized yes. um, um, and harem and figures and-, and I, I may be misremembering, but I think that there is a Delacroix painting that actually does turn a, a very white model yeah. into um, a more exoticized painting. Yeah, but in general, the iconography is remarkably vanilla. I mean, that's how I would describe it. And the bodies are fairly vanilla as well. Okay, I have one more question before we go to the chat, which is chock-a-block. Um, <laughs> um, in the plus a change category, um, I wonder how we might think about these very same questions um, some hundred years later. Um, and starting with the controversy over Robert Maplethorpe's male nudes in the 80s and 90s, and contemporary feminist stands like Catherine McKinnon on pornography today. So where are we? <laughs> where are we? I, you know, I would say that hasn't gotten easier for me to answer the more work I've done, you know? Um, I don't know where we are. I really myself hesitate between, and I think this is evident in the book, really wanting to acknowledge the reality of the production of these images and some of the terrible situations that the women who modeled in them must have experienced, you know? And then on the flip side, uh, I feel this way both about nude modeling and about prostitution that I think that it is in some fundamental sense, very hard for us today to understand the kinds of choices that women were making about how they could earn a living and what they had to do with their bodies to earn that living. And I, it's not really my place uh, from my perspective to condemn any of those choices, you know, so there's, or necessarily to, to say that I, I don't think they had any agency in those choices, I guess is how I would put it. So it's really hard. Um, and I, what, what I would just come back to always is that there is beauty in these images. There can be beauty. And so when I felt, when I still feel that I don't know what the ethics are sometimes even of writing about some of these images. I mean, I have looked at a lot of images and very few have made me sick, but I have seen some that were horrible. And, and then I come back to the fact that those horrible images do not mean that all images of the body have to signify in that way. And I guess that's part of what I was hoping to show in the book is that even with all these complicated realities, um, if we decide that the only way that bodies can signify is as a danger, as, as, as someone in distress or being um, coerced, then we're really missing something. We're missing something about the reality of our existence and of how we understand art and um, how we value particularly the female body. So. That's my non-answer <laughs> to your question. <laughs> okay, thank you. So let me go over to the chat. Um, Pamela Genova asks, did you run across many examples of male nudes um, aimed either at heterosexual or homosexual circles? Yeah, so male nudes, they do exist. They're very rare. They ended up getting the chopping block as I cut out images which I also kind of regretted that I didn't just in include one, but they're really, really uncommon. I mean, um, it's Abigail Solomon Godot and Anne McCauley who first remarked the ways in which the nude photographic industry, both licit and is illicit is really obsessed with the female body in the 19th century. And I completely concur. I will say that by the end of the century, you see more male bodies. Um, and you do see images that are clearly uh, homosexual. Like there's this uh, art publication called the Stereo Nu, and it includes these weird photographs of men wrestling naked, for instance. I mean, that might be exciting to some women too, but I get the sense that uh, 
I know that gay images exist, gay pornography in particular. I feel like it's way more underground because those sexual behaviors were so much more stigmatized. There's so much faux lesbianism, there's so much female body, and there's so much less imagery of men because of of the legal implications. Probably in private collections. Yes, and I think that once- Or destroyed by Or fame. destroyed, or yeah. once people had Kodaks starting in the 1880s, they were taking their own porn and keeping it very much out of the, the eyes of the public and police, yeah. Exactly. So this is sort of, sort of a follow-up from Andrew Counter on um, what could be included and what got excluded. He says, I'm intrigued by the full story of the suppression of the more obviously pornographic photos from your book. Um, could you describe how that played out and how you felt about it? Well, that played out in one of the most awkward phone conversations <laughs> I have ever had with someone. <laughs> with, uh. um, my editor, uh, who I had not yet met in person, and because of the pandemic, I still haven't, which, uh, you know, involved us getting on the phone and him systematically saying, yes, you may, and no, you may not. There is far too much vagina in that picture. Um, but what I am, eventually, I made the case that I had to include at least one or two very graphic images, because part of problem is, as I've, for instance, published articles is people essentially don't believe me when I say no, really, the porn was explicit. Imagine porn, it's porn. It's a little silly because people have to hold their poses for long <laughs> exposures and they're making funny faces, but it's porn. So, you know, there's a few images of penetration in the book. I mean, I'm fine. I sort of, that's also part of why there's, ironically, there's no graphic images for the later part of the century when I think there was far more graphic imagery circulating, but it was also because I felt like I showed you. There's, there's not much more to see. You get the drift, you know, the beaver shot, penetration, we're done. You got it, you know, so. But yeah, that was, it was initially put to me as a potentially an issue that um, if the book was printed in China, which it wasn't in the end, it was printed in the US, that it wouldn't be printed, that actually censors in China would refuse to print the book if it was too explicit. And later on, after we sort of worked through that, that was let go. But, you know, it was, it was just sort of choices also about how I wanted the book to signify and I didn't necessarily want to focus on the porn because I think that's more what we know I just sort of wanted enough to show people give them a taste yeah. so David Powell chimes in uh, it strikes me how much the, the beaver shot recalls the medico juridical um, documentation just a few years later 1880s um, that were taken and used to document and define homosexuality and homosexual factors mm -hmm. And then I think Anne popped in and mentioned Tao Dieu. Tao Dieu, as early as the 1870s. Okay. So um, there are really strong links, as I was saying, between the beaver shot and uh, even earlier, not photographs, but lithographs of female genitalia in medical texts, for instance. And Anne is actually someone who I talked to about this. Uh, she's in the footnote, if you read carefully. <laughs> um, and that's true. And actually, Tardieu is really fascinating because I talk about him in the book and how when these photographs of the beaver shop first started circulating, he was actually called in to do an analysis on prostitutes' bodies and state whether or not he thought their legs had been forced apart for the photographs, in which case the charges that could be levied against the photographers would be harsher than near um indecency so yeah there is a link between there's a very strong link between those images and m i think many other kind of medico juridical um images going backward and in the 1870s and 1880s um i don't talk about it because i in some sense didn't want to get sidetracked mm -hmm. down that path because the beaver shot so clearly signifies pornographically and that is its primary goal it's not medico or 
it is juridical in the sense that people went to prison for it, but you know, <laughs> yeah. the function of it is within the sphere of erotic and academic nude photography. Yeah. Um, I think both Andrea and Marnie are interested in the veil some more. Did, um, were your question, I think I said, we can take off the, you can unmute yourselves um, since we're coming to the end. Marnie and or Andrea, did you uh, have more specific questions about the veil of the title? I, um, it's, I, I'll just say, I was thinking about how in um, the late 19th century, this is Marnie, by the way, um, during the late 19th century, the veil was, as we all know, a very complex object, one that signified in many different ways. But one of the things that I discovered when I was working on it was that the veil was an object that was associated with propriety, that with proper women were expected to wear veils. Um, whereas um, prostitutes, for example, um, sumptuary law laws prevented prostitutes from wearing veils, though certainly they did. But you know, one of the one of the most interesting things about the veil to me is the way that it could function in all of these complicated ways. And so I was wondering specifically about um, whether you were thinking at all about the the everyday veil that women wore in order to exist in the public sphere um, at the time and how that veil really is a, a very, it has very different nuance or a very different kind of meaning than the veil that you're referencing. Mm -hmm. um, Marnie, I don't talk explicitly about that, although I do direct my readers to your book. Um, and uh, because in these images, and I think Andrea picked up on, Andrea picked up on this as well. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Andrea. Um, I was reading. No, yeah. Um, anyway, so the veil, the veiling that people are obsessed with in terms of um, uh, nude photography uh, is pretty much everywhere except the face, <laughs> is how I would describe it. It's, it's really an effect. Occasionally it'll cover the face, but it's really an effect for the body. Um, and so that's why the way that I talk about it doesn't really talk about facial veiling and the connection with propriety. Um, in terms of Andrea's question about Nana, that's I, in fact uh, at the heart of my chapter of Nana is talking about the relationship between Nana on stage and her translucent veil and how that ties back to the use of the veil in nude photography, the erotic use of it. So, yeah. Great. Um, I have one last question I'm going to throw out because I think everything has been covered. Um, and this is in honor of Michael Garval's birthday today. I had, <laughs> I had a more lengthy question about postcards for Mike, but um, do you have any examples of the, um, the proto photoshopped images of one woman's nude body with an actress or a famous person's uh, head? Uh... Yeah. I would have to dig through my computer. You know, I had an image of Sarah Bernhardt, which is yeah. the really famous one. Um, but the problem is nobody seems to know where that photograph is. So mm -hmm. it had to be taken out of the book. It's, <laughs> it's in a um, catalog, the most important catalog from the, the biggest show of these images, which was done at the BNF in the 90s. Um, and it was at the, I don't know even where they got it for that show because they just said it's in a private collection. And then since then it's kind of disappeared. So unfortunately I don't have, if I had dug through, I could dig through my computer, but I think it'll take too long, but I have seen one, but I couldn't include it because there was no way to track it down for rights purposes, unfortunately. Great. Well, we're just at two o'clock. I don't know. Um, Rachel, are we, do we need to finish up? Because there are a few more questions that have gotten posted since, since I, oh, wow, yes. Um, <laughs> um, what do you think, Rachel? Um, we could give another five minutes and then we can always just con continue the conversation in, the, in a less formal setting. Okay, so um, Richard uh, Shryock. I'm gonna get this right, yeah, okay. Photographs that showed women 
plus ou moins vêtu could be found to be pornographic in the 1880s if the clothing was arranged to emphasize certain parts of the body. That's very interesting. I did not know that. At any time, nakedness was not a determinant of obscenity. That's very clear. Uh, it has to do with, I mean, in many sense, it's totally, many cases, it's totally arbitrary, although not always, but it always has to do with what is being exposed in the clothing, how, how the women are posed and um, in what context the images are being sold, I think. Yeah. Okay. And Terry Dolan has a great comment. Baudelaire called, caused a kerfuffle with his quatrain de Lola de Valence by calling attention to her charme inattendu d'un bijou rose et noir a veiled uh, literary type of beaver shot. Um, and in 1866, he denies that he was being naughty, but I don't really believe him. Do you have any other examples from literature of such references? Um, I also don't believe him, uh, given <laughs> that uh, I talk extensively about references to the, the beaver shot in Une Charogne and A Une Martyre, uh, Baudelaire probably was being very naughty Mm -hmm. um, in terms of specific references to the beaver shot, I really, that particular perspective in my book, I focus mainly on references to it in Baudelaire. Um, I at one point read a very strange text by Zola's that was sort of in the back notes of an edition of his collected works that maybe was only tentatively attributed to him that seemed to be a, a long discussion of a woman's vagina. But don't quote me on that because I didn't include it in the book because it wasn't fully attribu attributed to him and also couldn't quite remember where I had read about it. But I would say thus far, um, Baudelaire is the one. I, now, he, I'm sure that there are such references in Pierre Louis. And I made a very conscious choice not to do any literary discussions of Pierre Louis in my book. I talk about the fact that he was an avid consumer of pornography and he took photographs of many of his lovers that were very explicit. And I actually chose not to write about him because one of the sets of photographs that I found that completely disgusted me was child pornography taken by Pierre Louis. So at that point, it didn't really interest me to go into detail in his literary references to um, the beaver shot or explicit representations of women's bodies because it was clear to me that he was making his own pornography and you know it was almost too clear what was going on but I wouldn't be surprised if there is a lot of such allusion in in his novels for instance and, and yeah. David Powell mentions Bijou and Discret of course yeah yeah exactly all right. Well, thank you so much, both for this wonderful book and for this great conversation. Um, so I think now, now we unmute. And now we unmute. And thank you both so, so much. Um, but everyone is welcome to unmute, uh, turn your cameras back on and uh, stick around with the beverage of your choice. <laughs> um, and we can continue to chat for anyone who would like to.